Obstetrics and Gynecology. Hello and welcome to Shotgun Q&A. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we'll look at 50 MCQ questions in one clinical course. Because today it's a special episode of Obstetrics and Gynecology and it includes two different courses in one, in essence, we shall cover 60 questions in this clinical course. This is season one, episode three. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. There is still a proportion of people who are watching the videos and are not yet subscribed to the channel. So please subscribe to the channel, drop a like on the video, drop a comment, show some support, share the link to this video and to an individual that you think they may benefit from this video and grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. Remember the ground rules of these videos. You can pause the video before I give you the answer. You should note down your answers and check your progress. Of course, count your total out of 60 in this case, not out of 50. So we'll begin with our question one. So I divided this into two sections. The first 30 questions are going to be obstetric questions and the last 30 questions are going to be gynecological questions. So question one, the average blood loss for a vaginal delivery approximates which of the following? Part A, 500 mils, part B, 1,000 mils, part C, 700 mils, D, somewhere between A and C, so somewhere between 500 to 700 mils. You may pause the video right now before I give you the answer. So this is again one of those things where you either know the answer or you don't. So most likely, normal, normally there should be about 500 mils that is lost in a vaginal delivery. Question two, the perineal body is formed partly by which of the following muscles? A, levator ani muscles, B, gluteus maximus, C, a bowel cavernous uh, or cavernosus, uh, D, ischio cavernosus. So again, this is another one of those questions where you either know it from your anatomy or you don't. So here the answer is C, the bowel cavernosus. Question three, uterine blood flow near term most closely approximates which of the following? A, 150 mils per minute, B, 350 mils per minute, C, 550 mils per minute, and D, 850 mils per minute. What is the normal uterine blood flow near term? Again, this is another fact where uh, you either know it or you don't. As you have noticed, some of these questions in obstetrics are not actually obstetric questions, but rather uh, an anatomy questions, physiology questions. So it means that you have to revise your maternal anatomy in your uh, clinical course. Of course, there are 550 uh, mils per minute. That's the normal uterine blood flow. Question four, which of the following is defined as the sum of still births and the neonatal deaths per 1,000 total births? A, fetal death rate. B, neonatal mortality rate. C, perinatal mortality rate, D, stillbirth rate. I think that's just from reading the question, you can already tell what the answer is. They're saying that death stillbirths. So it means that um, it's not just the neonates, because remember, neonates are defined as the first 28 days of life. So it's not just the neonates, it's also stillbirths that are being included. So that rules out option B. That also rules out option D. So that only leaves us with fetal death rate as well as uh, perinatal mortality. So fetal death rate, the fetus that are stillbirths are already dead by the time they're born. So most likely that um, what they have defined here is what is known as a perinatal mortality rate. So the answer is C. Question five, the field of obstetrics encompasses the following except which of the following? A, prenatal care, B, management of labor, C, infertility treatment, D, immediate newborn care. I know that if all the questions are hard and you're, you so far have a zero, I know that this one is going to be your one out of a 60. So here comes the answer. So obviously, uh, obstetrics is going to be dealing with pregnant women, the events surrounding pregnancy, okay? So meaning that when they are pregnant, just before, um, just when they're pregnant, uh, just before they give birth, during labor, 
just immediately after they give birth and of course during the preparium which is the, the six weeks after delivery so obviously there will be prenatal care which is part of obstetrics management of labor is part of obstetrics immediate newborn care is part of um, obstetrics but infertility is dealt with under gynecology so the answer is c Question six, which of the following conditions contributes the least to pregnancy-related deaths in Zambia? A, hemorrhage, B, thromboembolism, C, hypertensive disorders in pregnancy, D, anesthetic complications. You may pause the video. I know it's either you're doing very well or you're doing very bad at these questions. But whatever the case, please do not give up. So drop a like if these videos are helping you. Drop a comment too. Then let's look at... Some of these things. Hemorrhage is very common because postpartum hemorrhage, antepartum hemorrhage is very common in, in different pregnancies in the country. So are hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Because hypertension is also a common thing you where you have your preeclampsia, your eclampsia, your superimposed uh, preeclampsia on preexisting hypertension or just preexisting pre hypertension in pregnancy. But anesthetic complications are not so common. So your answer obviously here will be D anesthetic complications. Question seven, a long umbilical cord may be associated with which of the following? A, cord prolapse, B, cord uh, false notes, uh, C, cord pseudocyst, D, velamentous insertion of the cord. Again, remember the longer the cord, the length of the cord is proportional to the risk of prolapse. So the longer the cord, the longer it can actually prolapse. And remember when the cord is prolapsed and it is compressed by the fetal presenting part, this may lead to cord compression that may actually kill the child. So the length of the umbilical cord is directly proportional to cord prolapse um, risk. So the answer is A. Question eight, which of the following approximates the weight of the placenta at term? A, 200 grams, B, 500 grams, C, 1000 grams, D, 1,500 grams. This is another one of those things whether you either know it or you don't. There's pretty much no explanation that's there with facts. But rule of thumb is that, of course, the placenta must gradually increase in size during the pregnancy. So it's about 500 grams. Okay, it can be 200 grams. That's very small, a small placenta. It can be 1,000 grams. That's like quite a huge placenta, 1,500 being massive. Then question nine. A patient reports that the first day of her last menstrual period was September 19th, based on Nagel's rule. What is her due date? A, July 10th, B, June 14th, C, June 26th, D, December 12th. So you're not going to have a calendar in your exam hall. If you do have a calendar in the exam hall, lucky you, but I, I doubt you will be able to see it from where you're seated. So Nagel's rule is just the way in which we are going to be calculating our due date given the, the first date of the last menstrual period. So what you simply do is you add nine months to the um, LMP month and you add seven days to the first day of the last menstrual period. So if we're counting from September, so September plus nine months, so it's October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, June. So it means that this woman will be due in June. So we cancel out July, we cancel out December. Then we add seven days to um, the days. So 20th, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th. So obviously a due date will be June 26th. So the answer is June 26th. That's exactly how you calculate this. I hope it makes sense. Question 10. The limits of fetal viability are determined by which of the following? A. Kidney function. B. Pulmonary growth. C. Heart development. D. Fetal hepatic development. So which of the following largely determines fetal viability for the fetus to be able to survive outside the uterus. Of course, the most important thing is oxygen, air. So it means that the better the development of the lungs, the better the chance of survival outside the uterus. So pulmonary growth is the answer, B. Question 11. Preconception evaluation of a woman with diabetes mellitus should include all of the following except A. Hemoglobin A1c, B. Retinal examination, C. Bone density testing, D. Urine protein testing. So which of the following things are done to exclude 
diabetes. And of course, if you have studied diabetes, even in other courses like internal medicine, pediatrics, you should know this. And you, you do know that we, we do order for a hemoglobin A1C test, which can actually give you an indication of the glycemic control over the past 120 days. Of course, this is not an accurate way of measuring the glycemic control. You could alternatively use what is known as glycated fructosamine, which is much more specific. And of course, we do perform retinal examinations because there are some changes that may be associated with diabetes that affect the retina. We do also test the urine for proteins. We test the urine for ketones. But why would we want to do a bone density testing if we want to evaluate for diabetes? So your answer is C. Question 12. Which of the following anti-seizure medications when taken as monotherapy is associated with the highest risk of congenital malformations? Remember that um, with congenital malformations, there is a very, very big risk, especially with um, anti-epileptic drugs. So option A, phenytoin, option B, valproic acid, option C, phenobarbital, option D, carb carbamazepine. And the answer here is a B, valproic acid. Question 13, which of the following obstetric complications is not increased in obese patients? A, hypertension, B, fetal anomalies, C, cesarean deliveries, D, group B, streptococcal carrier frequency. Which of the following obstetric complications is not increased in obese patients? So you may pause the video at this moment. Now remember that whether you're pregnant or you're not pregnant, obesity is going to be uh, putting you at risk of hypertension. It's going to be putting you at risk of diabetes, which may be pre-existing or um, associated with the pregnancy, which is obviously also going to be associated with fetal anomalies. It's also going to be associated with a higher risk of cesarean section, but it has nothing to do with uh, you being a carrier of a group B streptococcal um, bacteria. So obviously it's going to be D as the answer. Question 14, common reasons cited by women for not attending antenatal care include the following. A, lack of money. B, the pregnancy is not yet big enough. C, long queues at antenatal clinics. D, all of the above. If you've ever escorted someone to antenatal, if you have ever gone to antenatal yourself, then you would know the reason why certain women do not go to the antenatal. For sure, some people lack money because of the distance between the uh, home and the place where they uh, find these antenatal services. And of course, sometimes patients may think that this pregnancy is not too far uh, long, uh, the um, progression. And also there are long lines because of the same um, understaffed hospitals and not enough facilities built in the country. So most commonly, all of these reasons have been cited for women not attending antenatal. So the answer is D, all of the above. Question 15, fetal movements are typical, uh, are typical felt for the first time at approximately what gestational age in weeks? A, 8 weeks, B, 14 weeks, C, 16 weeks, D, 18 weeks. Remember that the this process of perceiving fetal movements for the first time is known as quickening, as in your quick, quickening, uh, quickening. And this obviously happens roughly at around 16 weeks. So the answer there will be 16 weeks. Then question 16, all of the following conditions have been in, have increased risk in smokers except which one? A, preeclampsia, B, preterm birth, C, placenta abruption, D, sudden infant death syndrome. So they're, all they're just simply asking you is which of the following conditions is not uh, increased by smoking, Okay. So we can actually look at the options. If we look at sudden infant death syndrome, we have seen that a large proportion of infants actually die when the mothers are smokers. Then placenta abruption is also a risk factor for um, reasons known to obstetricians and gynecologists. We know that smoking also um, predisposes to preterm birth, but preeclampsia is not necessarily increased. So the answer would be A. Question 17. How much elemental iron should be given to pregnant women at a minimum as a supplement? A, 15 milligrams. B, 27 milligrams. C, 42 milligrams. D, 60 milligrams. Again, this is another question that you either know 
or you don't. That's the thing about obstetric and gynecology. You, it may sometimes ask you these straightforward questions that you may not have read in your textbook or you may not have come across. And of course, they'll pick the detail that they know that students are going to miss. So obviously, a woman that um, is pregnant requires about 27 um, milligrams of iron. So the answer is B. Question 18. What is the most common class of fetal malformations? A, cardiac, B, cleft palate and lip, C, neurotube defects, D, ventral wall abnormalities. You may pause the video. I know most of you are going to guess either B or C. If you're guessing B or C, just know that I know what you're thinking about. Okay, so here comes the answer. So most commonly cardiac um, malformations are the most common. So cardiac is A. Question 19, what is the normal amniotic fluid volume at term in milliliters? A, 300 milliliters, B, 800, C, 1,200, D, 1,500. So you may pause the video if you may. So remember that if you have an increase in amniotic fluid amount, you refer to that as polyhydramnios. If you have a decrease in amniotic fluid amount, you refer to that as oligohydramnios. There are also other parameters like the single deepest pool, even the amniotic fluid index that are used to make a diagnosis of either polyhydramnios or oligohydramnios. But normally a term you have roughly around 800 milliliters. So your answer here is going to be P. Question 20. Which of the following medications is associated with oligohydramnios when taken in the latter half of pregnancy? A. Hydralazine. B. Beta blockers. C. Calcium channel blockers. D. Angiotensin enzyme receptor blockers. Again, this one is a pharmacology tie-in. If you know the pharmacology of these drugs, and uh, let me just give you a background. Hydralazine is used as an antihypertensive. It is a vasodilator. Uh, beta blockers are obviously adrenergic um, antagonists that are going to be blocking beta receptors. Calcium channel blockers are calcium channel blockers. They'll be blocking calcium channels. So you have those that works solely on the heart. You uh, refer to them as cardioselective uh, calcium channel blockers. You have those that work on the heart and the blood vessels. And then you have those that work predominantly on blood vessels. Then angiotensin converting uh, enzyme, angiotensin re enzyme receptor blockers, these are going to be blocking the angiotensin enzyme. Okay, so most likely D, the angiotensin uh, enzyme receptor blockers are the ones that are going to be associated with oligohydramnios. So you can actually search up the mechanism uh, as to which this causes um, the, the oligohydramnios and comment in the section below. Then question 21, which of the following is true about the modified biophysical profile? A, is superior to other forms of fetal surveillance. B, it combines non-stress testing with fetal breathing assessment. C, it is normal in the if the amniotic fluid index is 5 cm and the non-stress test is reactive. D, it has a false negative rate of about 4.8 per 1,000 tests and a false positive rate of 15, oh, 1.5%. You may pause the video if you may, but most likely the only one that makes sense out of all these options is option C. So normally if the amniotic fluid index is about five centimeters, the normal is about two to eight centimeters. Remember how you how you find amniotic fluid? You divide the uterus in four, the amniotic fluid index, you divide the uterus into four, um, four, what do you call these things? Quadrants. Then from each quadrant, you get the, the, the deepest pool, which doesn't contain any fetal parts. It doesn't contain any, amnio any uh, umbilical cord. Then you simply add them and find an average. So that's um, probably going to be between 2 to 8 centimeter. So the answer will be C. Question 22, HIV and pregnancy, which of the following is true? An HIV test must be done during antenatal period. B, HIV in pregnancy is currently a huge public health concern. C, heart is commenced after first trimester. D, 70% of transmission occurs antepartum. You may pause the video if you are writing down answers or if you're screaming at your screen, you may pause the video right now because here comes the answer. So there is going to be a lot of debate concerning this question. I know most of you 
have obviously ruled out D. If you've put D as the answer, then I don't know. I don't know what you're thinking. But remember that 80% of transmission of HIV happens during labor. Then about 10% or so happens uh, before uh, in the antepartum. Then, of course, um, about 5%, 5 5 before and as well as after through breastfeeding. Then, of course, the HIV drugs should be given at any time that you find a diagnosis of HIV. You don't have to wait for the first trimester to end. But between A and B, so I would go for B as the answer. And let me explain. Of course, HIV can be passed on from the mother to the child. That's what makes it a very huge concern uh, in terms of the public health realm. And we do HIV tests for all pregnant women, but it's not a must, okay? Um, the USAID, the WHO are actually against mandatory testing um, in, in terms of HIV, so it's not mandatory that this woman must be tested. So if this statement was an HIV test can be done during antenatal period, I would have gone for that option. But I think the best answer here would be B. HIV in pregnancy is currently a huge health concern. Question 23. In multiple pregnancy, which of the following is true? A. Identical twins are the commonest type of twinning. B. Malpresentation are common in labor. C. Oxytocin is contraindicated when delivering the second twin. If second twin is in transfer slide, cesarean section is indicated. You may pause the video right now. So let's walk through each of the options. So identical twins are twins that are going to be arising from one fertilized egg that splits into two. And they, they are all of the same sex. They are all looking alike and it's, it's very, very confusing. Fraternal twins are as a result of ovulation twice and two different spermatozoa fertilize two different eggs. So commonly, the fraternal twins are much more common than identical twins. We move on now to option D. If the second twin is in transverse lie, cesarean section is indicated. This is, of course, ridiculous. Okay, so you, you do not just take them for cesarean section just because the second twin is in transverse lie. You can man manipulate this twin to actually engage into the right position. Then, of course, we do use oxytocin because remember that uh, multiple pregnancy puts this woman at a higher risk of postpartum hemorrhage. So you, we do use oxytocin. But B, malpresentation are much more common in labor. This is true for uh, twin pregnancies because the, the twins could be facing the opposite direction. They could, what is known as the interlocking twins. One of them would be in transverse slice. Some of them would be in longitudinal. And so there are different malpresentations that may be there. So the answer is B. Question 24, regarding heart disease and pregnancy. A, it is a common cause of maternal mortality in Zambia. B, pregnancy termination is warranted when the condition is diagnosed early in pregnancy. C, ischemic heart disease patients should undergo C-section. D, there is no limitation in physical activity in women who are class 1 New York heart classification. So again, here, there may be some huge debates. So let's rule out some of the answers. So of course, patients that have ischemic heart disease, you wouldn't want to put them under the stress of labor. So they should ideally go undergo a C, uh, or rather they can undergo uh, a C-section, but it's not mandatory. It's not always uh, that they will undergo a C-section. Then of course, pregnancy uh, termination is not warranted for all patients that have a heart disease. Um, then... Whether it's common cause of mortality in Zambia, you would have to check the statistics on that. But what makes sense is the ones that are in class one are not having any physical limitation. You should look up the New York heart classification. Then question 25, about shoulder dystocia, choose the most correct option. A, it occurs more commonly in primigravida compared to multigravida. B, fundal pressure has a role in the management. C, it can occur in babies less than 3 kg. D, McRoberts maneuver involves exaggerated extension of maternal hips. Okay, so again here, most commonly, it occurs in babies that are quite huge, but it doesn't rule out the babies that are less than 3 uh, kg. So it can, where the shoulders actually, in, uh, or the presenting part, in this case the shoulders, um, of the fetus actually in, impacting 
on the pelvis of the mother. You do not apply fundal pressure in shoulder dystocia. Please never apply fundal pressure in shoulder dystocia. Do not pull on the cord either. Question 26. Vaginal delivery is contraindicated in the presence of A, previous cesarean section for uh, CPD, B, uh, prolapse, cord prolapse in second stage, C, transverse lie of the second twin, D, previous uterine rapture, E, in a patient with a previous ectopic pregnancy. So, of course, the one that you would definitely not want to deliver vaginally is someone who has a cord prolapse, especially in a second stage of labor. You would immediately convert that to a C-section. So, that would be an option B. Question 27. Regarding oxytocin, one of these is false. A, it can cause uterine rupture. B, fetal distress is not a complication. C, it can lead to water intoxication. D, it is a neuropeptide. E, it is also produced by men. Remember that oxytocin is going to be produced by nuclei that are found in the hypothalamus and it's going to be released by the posterior pituitary gland. In the female, oxytocin has certain functions. One of the functions of oxytocin is that it stimulates the contraction of the gravid uterus to augment and propagate labor. The second function of oxytocin is that it's going to stimulate the myoepithelial cells that are surrounding the breast to contract and to ejaculate milk. The third function is that oxytocin is actually what is known as the pleasure hormone. So it's what is released during sexual interactions and it causes you to have pleasure. So it means men do actually produce the oxytocin. And oxytocin has a very similar uh, structure to ADH actually. So the fact that it causes uterine to contract, it may result in uterine rupture. So that is true. It may uh, lead to water intoxication because it has a similar structure to ADH. It is a neuropeptide because it's produced from the nuclei in the hypothalamus. It is also produced in men, but of course it does sometimes cause fetal distress. So the answer here would be B. B is the one that's false. Question 28, about magnesium sulfate, which of the following is true? A, it causes respiratory distress. B, it is nephrotoxic. C, the antidote is calcium sulfate. D, it's indicated in all patients with preeclampsia. Again, let's walk through all the options. We start with option D. It's not indicated in all patients with preeclampsia. The only patients that get magnesium sulfate are the ones that have Severe preeclampsia. Remember, preeclampsia is divided into mild uh, preeclampsia and severe preeclampsia. The severe preeclampsia are the ones that are going to receive you. You don't give magnesium sulfate to the mild uh, preeclampsia patients. Of course, the, the antidote is not calcium uh, sulfate. It's calcium gluconate. Then, of course, um, B, it is, it's not nephrotoxic. Then it does cause respiratory distress, which is why one of the parameters that you check before you administer a dose of magnesium, you have to check, number one, the um, respiratory uh, rate. You have to check the reflexes. You also have to check the urine output. Okay? So that's A. Question 29. In purpuropyrexia, which of these... Uh, is false. A commonly results in maternal mortality. B usually appears two to ten days after delivery. C cannot be caused by chlamydia. D temperatures have to be at least thirty-eight degrees. Again, the one that doesn't really make sense is it cannot be caused by chlamydia because it can be caused by chlamydia. It can be caused by infections. So C is the answer. Then the last question on the obstetrics part, in premature preterm rapture of membranes or PPROM, which of these is not an indication for delivery? A, oligohydramnios, B, martino tachycardia, C, fetal tachycardia, D, meconium stained lycra. I mean, this doesn't need any rocket science for you to actually think about it. The option A, C, and D are dealing with the fetus, so obviously that will be warranting that. A delivery, but just because the mother's heart is racing, does that indicate a delivery? I don't think so. So your answer would be option B. Moving on now to the gynecology section, which I believe is much easier in this um, episode than the obstetrics question. So if you still are below thirty or you're still below fifteen, this here is a chance for you to redeem yourself. Question thirty-one. 
The uterus and fallopian tubes arise from the following structures. A. Wolfian ducts. B. Mullerian ducts. C. Urogenital sinus. D. Sinovaginal bulbs. E. Mesonephric ducts. You may pause the video. And of course, the answer is the Mullerian duct. That's B. Question 32. Which of the following is an example of an indirect maternal death? A. Septic shock following an abortion. B. Aspiration following an eclamptic seizure. C. Hemorrhage following a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. D. Aortic rupture at 36 weeks in a patient with an aortic aneurysm. So which of the following is an indirect maternal death? So they're just saying which of the following is not directly caused. What is not causing the other directly? So septic abortion can... Uh, an abortion can lead to septic shock. That is, the mother can die from that. So that is a direct cause. Uh, aspiration can arise from an eclamptic seizure that can result in death. So that is a direct cause. So it means that if we take out the aspiration, we take out the eclamptic seizure, this mother wouldn't die. A ruptured ectopic pregnancy, of course, that's obvious. Hemorrhage, you die. But of course, an aortic uh, rupture may not be necessarily um, the the direct cause of um, ma the maternal death. So it's usually indirect. Um, so the answer here will be D. Question 33. The inferior epigastric artery arises from which of the following? A, aorta, B, femoral artery, C, hypogastric artery, D, external iliac artery. Again, this is one of the anatomy questions where you either know it or you don't. And obviously the inferior epigastric artery is going to be arising from the external iliac artery. So the answer there will be D. Question 34. The labia minora lacks or except which of the following? A. Ercrine glands. B. Hair follicles. C. Apocrine glands. D. Sebaceous glands. So they are just simply asking you which of the following is found in the labia majora or minora rather. So again, this is one of the things where you either know it or you don't. So obviously you have sebaceous glands, which are the ones that are present. And these are the structures and not. Question 35. What is the average duration of the normal menstrual cycle? A, 14 to 28 days. B, 25 to 32 days. C, 28 to 55 days. D, 40 to 50 days. I mean, if you guess 40 to 50 days and you are a female, I think that's big unfair, really. Being very, very unfair. Anyways. So this is a, a straightforward giveaway um, question. So obviously the answer will be B, 25 to 32 days. That's the closest. But there are some people that can actually even go as short as 21 days. There are some people that can go as high as 35 days. Question 36. Of the 2 million oocytes present at birth, how many are present at the onset of puberty? A, 200,000. B, 300,000. C, 400,000. D, 500,000. Again, one of those questions where you either know or you don't. So most likely this is C, 400,000 oocytes. And yes, actually, um, this process in the female is a very wasteful process. Remember, you're born with 2 million oocytes and all of a sudden, 400,000 are the ones that are present at puberty. And it's not all of these that are going to be... Um, released each month is going to be one that's released the others die so in short you're going to release in a lifetime about 365 close to that um cycles okay oh eggs rather oh this close to this um number here then question 37 how many weeks does the embryonic period last a four weeks b eight weeks c 10 weeks d 12 weeks another question where you either know it or you don't, but the answer here is C, 10 weeks. Question 38, most common cause of first trimester abortion is A, chromosomal anomalies, B, syphilis, C, rhesus isoimmunization, D, cervical incompetence. Which of the following causes first trimester abortion? The rule of thumb is this. Um, if you have a problem in the genetics, if you have a problem in the DNA, it means that organogenesis is happening in the first trimester. So the body is going to be rejecting this. The mother is going to say, the mother's body is going to sense that whatever you have made here isn't really right um, in layman's terms. So it's going to try and get rid of it. But other things that can creep up in the later stages are like infections that may affect the development and cause the, the pregnancy to abort, uh, cervical incompetence as you uh, get much, much older in the um, 
pregnancy or the, as the pregnancy gets older. And then, of course, uh, syphilis and recess so immunization, which is a complication of um, a mother that's recess negative marrying a dad that is recess positive. So the answer there will be A, chromosome anomalies. Question 39. Complete moles are A, triploid, B, diploid, C, have normal beta HCG levels, D, 2% of the cases convert to carcinoma, uh, E, chance of malignance conversion less than partial mole. Remember that molar pregnancies or uh, high identity for moles, uh, if, yeah, they're of two types. You have the complete mole uh, and you have the incomplete mole. So complete mole, there will be literally no fetal parts if you look at the ultrasound. And then in the incomplete time, you have uh, fetal parts. Then in the, in, in the complete type, you have an empty egg being fertilized by either two spermatozoa or one spermatozoa that duplicates its DNA. So obviously, there will be diploid. In an incomplete mole, you have um, two um, spermatozoa uh, fertilizing one egg with no more DNA. So you will have triple the amount of uh, chromosomes. Then, so the answer here will be B. The, the amount of uh, HCG that's present in complete mole is very high. And of course, the chance of uh, conversion to carcinoma is slightly higher than uh, 2%. And of course, uh, it is higher with the complete moles than it is with the partial moles. Snowstorm appearance on ultrasound is seen in A, high density of four mole, B, ectopic pregnancy, C, anencephaly, D, none of the above. So it's seen in high density of four moles. Question 41. A woman delivers a 4.5 kg infant with a midline episiotomy and suffers a third degree tear. So this is a perineal tear or perineal laceration. Inspect, inspection shows which of the following structures is intact. A, the amyl sphincter, B, the perineal body, C, the, the perineal muscle, D, the rectal mucosa. So this is just simply grading of the uh, perineal tears. Remember that the graded one up to four, please look up the grading of this perineal tears. But for this question, most likely the rectal mucosa is not going to be involved. So the rectal mucosa is the answer. And we move on to question 42. So most common cause of vesicle fistula in Zambia is A, poorly performed gyne surgery, B, irradiation, C, obstructed labor, D, trauma, E, forceps delivery. Remember that a vesicle vaginal fistula is just an abnormal connection between the vagina and the bladder. This is very, very common in obstructed labor. That's one of the most common causes. Um, question 43, all of all are risk factors for vaginal candidiasis except A, HIV, B, hypertension, C, pregnancy, D, diabetes mellitus, E, antibiotic use. So vaginal candidiasis is often caused by candida albicans, which is um, a fungal infection. So immunosuppression does uh, predispose you to fungal infection. So HIV does. Uh, pregnancy does because it also suppresses the immune system to some extent. Um, diabetes also does. Antibiotics usually clear out the other normal flora that are supposed to be competing with this fungi such that the fungi now will predominate. So that also does. But hypertension, how many people are hypertensive that you know that have vaginal candidiasis? If you answered that question, then no comment. Question number 44. Strawberry cervix is... A feature of A, vaginal candidiasis, B, HSV infection, C, bacterial vaginosis, D, trichomonas vaginitis, E, gonococcus. So obviously the answer here is D. It's either you know it or you don't. So it's a trichomonas vaginal, vaginitis. Um, question 45. Uh, clue cells are seen in A, bacterial vaginosis, B, candidiasis, C, trichomoniasis, D, gonorrhea, E, chlamydial infection. So clue cells are just simply epithelial cells that are going to be covered in cocoa bacilli. These are seen in bacterial vaginosis. So the answer is A. Question 46. Drugs used in, for ovulation induction are, except A, a gonadotrophin releasing hormones, B, clomifen citrate, C, gonadotrophins, D, letrozole, E, danozole. So again, these are is a pharmacological tie-in. One of the uh, drugs that's used is the drug that's used to um, manage endometriosis, which is danazole. It does not cause ovulation. It also actually causes uh, atrophy of the endometrium. So danazole is the only drug here that doesn't cause ovulation and it can't be used as an ovulation induction agent. Question 47. Infertility by chlamydia is due to A, 
endometritis, B. Ophritis, C. Cervicitis, D. Salpingitis, E. Peritonitis. This already just makes sense. If there's a passage and the passage is blocked, the egg is not going to go, it's not going to be fertilized. So salpingitis is often the cause which is affecting the fallopian tube. Question 48. Infertility is seen in A. Fibroid uterus, B. Endometriosis, C. Adenomyosis, D. PID, E. All of the above. Again, this is another straightforward question. Um, like I told you, if you see two options in your multiple choice questions that you are really sure of, and you also have an all of the above option, it is most likely that it's an all of the above. So infertility is seen as caused by all of these conditions. So the answer is E. Then question 49, aspermia is the term used to describe A, absence of sperm or absence of semen, B, absence of sperm in ejaculate, C, absence of sperm motility, D, occurrence of abnormal sperm, E, a low sperm uh, count is supposed to be count, not a count. So R, remember R just means without, spermia without sperm in ejaculate. So the answer is B. And then there's a term that's known as oligozoospermia. Or, which is pretty much a reduced um, sperm count in um, the ejaculates. You have less than 15 million. Question 50. The failure rate of combined oral contraceptives, estrogen plus progesterone, is A, 1 to 2%, B, 5 to 6%, C, 6 to 10%, D, 10 to 12%, E, 16 to uh, 18%. So here again, there has been some controversy concerning the literature and what different literature is saying but what has been common is that it's between five to six percent which is b question 51 contraindications for use of intrauterine contraceptive device include all except a pelvic inflammatory disease b thromboembolic disease c pelvic tuberculosis d ovarian cancer e septic abortion so we do not, and I repeat, we do not put any intrauterine device if there is an infection or if there is um, surrounding infection in the genitourinary tract or in the um, reproductive system. So if there is a PID, we do not insert an IUD. If there is a tuberculosis of the pelvis, we do not insert an IUD. If there is a septic abortion, we do not insert an IUD. Ovarian cancer, we do not insert an IUD. But of course, thromboembolic disease, you, you can actually insert an IUD for that. The only, contra or the only contraindication for this would be with the oral contraceptive pills. Okay, but of course, there should be a debate now within a B and D, ovarian cancer and thromboembolic disease, whether ovarian cancer, you can insert an IUD or you can't, and then thromboembolic disease because... Um, Anyways, they haven't mentioned that this one contains hormones, so never mind. So the answer there will be B. Question 52. Uh, levonorgestrel intrauterine system is A, a non-hormone-releasing IUCD, B, a hormone-releasing IUCD, C, a barrier, D, a behavioral contraceptive, E, does not cause amenorrhea. So again, if you have read about this and you've come across this, you would know that this is a hormone-releasing intrauterine um, device okay so it's a hormone releasing device the level of is the uh, type of progesterone question 53 oral contraceptive pills are contraindicated in a heart disease b thromboembolism c breast cancer d all of the above again rule of thumb if you're sure about two things then most likely option d is the answer or the all of the above is the answer contraceptive pills put you at risk of thrombi forming especially the ones that have estrogen within them they cause hypercoagulability of the blood. Uh, estrogen also drives um, breast cancer. Prolonged estrogen exposure drives is a driv driven factor for breast cancer. Same thing with um, heart disease because of the uh, dyslipidemias that may be associated. So all of the above is the answer. Question 54. Progesterone of choice in emergency contraception is um, DMPA, which is um, Depo Provera. Uh, levonogestrel, um, C, nogestrone, D, micronized progesterone. So in plan B, we only get levonogestrel, which is B, the answer, ironically. Question 55, and we're almost towards the end. If you still haven't subscribed and you have reached this 
uh, part you still haven't dropped the like you've recessed but please drop a like right now so question 55 mephipristone is used in a ectopic pregnancy b fibroid uterus c molar pregnancy d habitual abortion e induction of labor with a live baby i think the only one that makes sense here remember that mephipristone is actually helps to ripen the cervix so you, get, you can actually use it in induction of labor with a live baby it doesn't make sense for you to use mephipristone in someone who has an ectopic pregnancy nor does it make sense to use it in someone who has fibroids nor does it make sense to use it in someone who is having a habitual abortion okay but with induction of labor you may use mephipristone all of the question 56 all are used to shrink fibroids except a estrogen b danazol c mephipristone d um gonadotrophin releasing hormone analog so again, this should make sense. If you know what fibroids are, remember that fibroids are benign tumors of the endometrium. They are going to, of, of the myometrium rather, they are going to be made up of um, this um, tumor, which is pretty much a tumor of smooth muscle cells. And it's going to be driven by estrogen, which is why before menopause, it tends to grow. After menopause, it doesn't grow, it doesn't shrink, it just remains the same size. So we do not give estrogen to patients with fibroids because you'll, you'll make it worse. you make it grow much larger because these tumors are estrogen-driven. So estrogen is the answer. Question 57. Fibroids, usually I see the irony of me answering the next question. Fibroids usually increase after menopause. B, usually regress after menopause. C, usually remain the same after menopause. D, none of the above. E, depends on the patient. So I've already given you the answer. So they usually remain the same after menopause because estrogen is no longer there. Question 58. Asymptomatic myomas. A, need follow-up. B, does not need removal if it is small. C, needs immediate removal because they will grow big. D, all of the above. E, A and B. So in the people that have symptomatic fibroids, if there are no symptoms, don't remove it. If it's small, don't remove it. All you simply do is uh, perform annual examinations and annual follow-ups, regular checkups, uh, regular ultrasounds just to uh, monitor the progress of the condition. And so they do not need immediate removal. So obviously option E, A and B are correct. Question 59. Commonest site of fertilization in is A, isthmus, B, ampulla, C, infundibulum, and um, D, interstitium. Remember that these are parts of the fallopian tube. Um, so most likely the widest part is where the fertilization is going to be taking place, which happens to be the ampulla. The last and indeed the final question to uh, set you home. So the length of the female urethra is A, 20 millimeters, B, 40 millimeters, C, 60 millimeters, D, 80 millimeters. So take your time, pause the video. It's the last question. This may actually be the mark that gets you to 30 out of 50, or this may be the mark that actually gets you to 50 out of 60, rather, not 50. Um, this may get you from an A to an A+, plus, a B to a B+, plus, or a C to a C+. Plus. Oh, hell, even a D to a D+, plus, or a D+, plus to a C+, plus, or a C-. minus. Anyways, so... Remember that the female urethra is actually short as compared to the male urethra. And it can actually be as short as 19 centimeters, but it can reach up to as long as 45 centimeters. But with most of the literature that I've come across, most of them range around the value of it being around 40 millimeters. So that's four centimeter long. Grade yourself and see how much you got out of 60. If you indeed got 50 out of 60, that's excellent work. You're pretty much ready for your exam. If you got between 40 to 49, that's pretty good. Just continue studying smart and take your time to note the subtle changes. If you got between 30 to 39, then this is a fair performance. You should spend more time studying the relevant material and you can actually improve your grade if you do the right things. If you got between 25 to 29, this is pretty average, so don't be too comfortable with a bare minimum performance. This is actually quite below average. Then 20 to 24, way below average, so you should change your study methods and you should ask for some help. And anyone who got below 20, please seek help. And do not be afraid to ask help. Send me an email, send me a text message if you really need help on something. 
there is always help that's going to be provided to you because our aim on the medical channel is to push everyone so that they can progress and so that they can excel and make their dreams come true. With that said in mind, from Shotgun Q&A, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Let's make your dreams come true. Subscribe if you haven't. Share the video. Drop a comment. Drop a like. God bless to Zambia and beyond. And